Goedenavond, dames en heren. Heel korte introductie van mij. U weet allemaal waarvoor u hier bent voor Dr. Jane Goodall. It's a great honor to have her here. Um, she will introduce the movie you're going to see, the movie by the uh, shot uh, made by the the the, the old the refound footage of uh, Hugo van Lavik. Um, she's, Jane Goodall is going to introduce it, the movie to you. And it's wonderful to have her here. I think um, not only did she um, cross uh, into uh, the first, for the first time in the history of our species into um, conversation with other species and understanding them and having empathy for them, I think that's a world, um, uh, uh, that's a, a remarkable moment in the history of mankind. She also was um, one of the first researchers who was male. Um, uh, to uh, enter into the male-dominated world of academics. And she's been an inspiration, I have to say, to me personally um, uh, uh, throughout my life, the way she's conducting her research and the way she's living her life. And I think that's true for many, many people um, of my age and of all ages. It's a great, great honor to have uh, uh, Dr. Goodall here. And it's wonderful working together with her institute, who does wonderful work. So uh, please make sure that you take note of the institution and what they do for our planet. Dr. Jane Goodall. Well, thank you. And it's really great to be here. And thank you for your contribution to making this happen. Um, I think we should all thank you and your staff. And let's give him a hand too. So, this movie, Jane, you know, there have been many documentaries made about Jane and the Chimps. And I was approached, I think it was about four, just over four years ago, by somebody from National Geographic in the US and asked if I would be interested in cooperating on a retrospective made from footage that had been shot by my first husband back in the early 60s and kind of forgotten, archived. And then somebody was going around and listing the archival material, and they thought, maybe this is interesting, and they went to somebody high up in the geographic. Um, the high up person in the geographic thought, hey, maybe we can make another film. So they came and asked me, and I said, oh, another film about me and the chimps, come on. <laughs> but in the end, the Jane Goodall Institute in the US convinced me that I should cooperate because they said, you know, we're always trying to raise money, we have all our programs in Africa, and this will raise the profile of the Jane Goodall Institute. So I agreed. And I didn't actually have to do anything. They said, all you will have to do is one three-hour interview for adding to the old footage. So I thought, well, that's fine. One three-hour interview, that's fine. Then they approached Brett Morgan, who's the director of this Jane, you'll see his work in a moment, and asked if he would be interested in making a documentary about Jane and the Chimps. And he said, what, another film about Jane and the Chimps? <laughs> but then they sent him some footage, and he changed his mind. He felt, and probably this man is not known in the Netherlands, but he's very famous in America, as the writer of uh, film scores, music for films, and that's, his name is Philip Glass. So, you do know him, right. So, Brett Morgan wrote to Philip Glass and said, you know, would you possibly do music for a film about Jane and the Chimps? And Philip Glass said, well, I'm not doing this sort of thing anymore. So, Brett said, well, if I send you a bit of footage, will you look at it? So, Philip said yes and the footage was sent, and after two weeks, Philip wrote back and said, oh, all right, I'll do it, I'm in love with Jane too. So, <laughs> so anyway, so that, that's how the film uh, came to be made. But when you watch it, I want you to realize that this footage was shot with an old-fashioned film camera, none of your digital stuff. It was an old Bolex, maybe some of you remember the old Bolex, and you had celluloid film, and you had to thread it through all these sprockets, 
You probably don't even know what a sprocket is. It's a little wheel with, with, with pins. I don't know how you describe a scrocket. Scro sprocket. Anyway, and then you have to thread the film through the gate. And if there's any little bit of hair in the gate, it ruins the entire roll of film. And the film's very expensive. And Hugo, my uh, ex-husband, who shot the film, who was sent out to make this film back in 1962, uh, he had to carry the Bolex around, he had to carry the tripod around, there was no film team, and to change film, he had to put a black hood over his head, like that old-fashioned thing. Now he's out in the bush, and so it's pretty amazing when you look at this film to see how, with a little touching up, which they can do now, how incredible this film is. And Hugo has now been designated as one of the most um, famous wildlife photographers ever. And I think when you watch the film, you'll see why that is. So I think one of the reasons, or, or let, me, let me start differently. Let me say, out of all the documentaries that have been made about me and the chimpanzees, this is the only one that when I watched it for the first time, I was taken right back into the skin of myself at 26. I could actually feel being there. And I was with those chimpanzees that I got to know so well, David Greybeard and Flo and Fifi. And it was a very moving experience when I first saw this footage. And I didn't see it until it was almost ready. I didn't have anything to do with it. However, the three-hour interview, I went to Dar es Salaam, where I have a house and my son was, uh, to do this three-hour interview. And I got there and I found a film team of, I think it was 38 people. And they had rebuilt my little guest house to make it look like the house at Gombe. And they had this incredible equipment. And they had rented from the people along the roadside who sell plants in pots, palm trees, and this, that, and the other. And this entire place, my little guest house, was transformed into something that looked like Gombe. And there was a hugely expensive uh, piece of equipment which turned daylight into night and night into day. And I thought to myself, one three-hour interview for all this, that's not going to be. No, it was three days. <laughs> Actually, it was three days. But I think, well, you'll see, you'll see those interviews. But I think what took me right back into how I was at 26 is because Brett had the idea of using the audio version of one of my books. So it's my voice talking about how I felt at the time when these scenes were unfolding. Not some commentator coming in from outside with a scripted, you know, somebody had written a script for him. And so it, it, it was me and I was back there. There's another thing that makes it very special and that is the sounds of the insects and the birds and the rippling of the stream and the rain. That was recorded at Gombe by the man who is said to be the premier recorder of wildlife sounds, certainly in the US. And his name, his name is, uh, I can't remember his name right now, um, Brian, it'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, this is authentic sounds from Gombe. And so, in all of these ways, this film is different from any other that's ever been made. And then this film shot by Hugo van Lauwijk, and of course he's Dutch, so this is a direct connection with, with the Netherlands. My first husband was Dutch, and I actually happen to be quarter Dutch. My great-great-grandfather came, uh, came from the Netherlands to England. So there's a connection with, with Holland. I still think of it as Holland. And I'm told it's OK because Amsterdam is actually in Holland. And it's only when it's the whole of the Netherlands that it needs to be the Netherlands. It's a bit like England. I still say I come from England, which is now the UK. But where I am in Bournemouth in the south is actually England. So it's kind of the same, isn't it? Anyway. I don't think there's very much to say more about this film, except that I hope you enjoy it. 
I will say that it's had more appreciation from the people in the US and other parts of the world than any other documentary. The National Geographic produced it and it actually made almost two million going round the theatres, which for a documentary is unique. It's had just about every award that it can get at all the film festivals around the country. It was premiered in the Hollywood Bowl, which seats 17,000 people. It's the only documentary in living history that has filled all those 17,000 seats. And the, it's, it's open. And that night, there were stars up in the sky, and it was chilly, we had blankets. But Philip Glass came himself in person, and there was a live orchestra, 78-piece orchestra. So the music was live while we were watching the film on this huge screen. And it was the most magical night. And the last thing I'll say is, okay, it didn't get an Oscar. Um, I was interviewed by quite a few journalists, and they were all saying, it's absolutely ridiculous that this film wasn't nominated for an Oscar. And one of them was so angry that he started interviewing the people who vote to nominate a film for an Oscar. And there are 300 of them, and it's highly political. And so he talked to this one man, he said, why wasn't Jane nominated for an Oscar? And the man said, well, if it had been nominated, it would have got the Oscar. <laughs> so he said, excuse me? And the guy said, the committee doesn't want this kind of movie to have an Oscar. They want something uh, that, that's dark and modern and hard hitting like drugs in Russia for their documentary. And so it didn't get an Oscar. But it did get what they call the Green Oscar, which is in Berlin at the uh, Peace Film Festival that they hold every year. So that I think is even better because there's no politics there. So there you are, that's the film, that's how it was made. And I just hope you enjoy it. Thank you.